Hello, John, in California. How are you? Hi there, how are you? Oh, not bad, thanks. Well, we're here to talk about your career, your fabulous career and the Strangers and Marvin Walsh and Farrah and everything. I just wanted to start off by asking you, you're a Melbourne lad. Whereabouts did you grow up? Until I was about 15, I lived in Mooney Ponds, oh. Barry Humphreys land. Oh, OK. And, um, and then we moved up to Nidri, I think. Lived there until, until we got married. The big move to Nidri. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> A push bite right away it was what got you interested in music in the first place John? i think i probably I, I saw that show ranch party that was on television one night and uh, it was a little kid called larry collins playing a double neck guitar and i got a feeling it was something to do with that and then i started to sing sort of country and western songs and my mum bought me a little country sort of guitar and i joined the banjo club wow the banjo club <laughs> <laughs> I started to race home from school and my brother had a little 19 pound record player and I used to sit there every night after school trying to work out solos off records on my guitar that was almost impossible to play. It was yeah. just so high. Yes, yeah. <laughs> So would you say that's when the passion started? Oh yeah, it was yeah, probably about 13 or 14 years old, I think. Were you from a musical background? Were your mother or father musicians or did they have music in the No, house? they weren't, but, but we always used to have like family sing-alongs and that. We, I was from a sort of pretty big family. The house I lived in, there was probably about 10 people living in it when I was a little kid. Oh, right. Aunties and uncles and we had a couple of boarders. And, so it was, uh, you know, there was always card games and sing-alongs. Yeah, and that would have brought out the uh, young performer in you, I imagine. <laughs> As is the case with a lot of us musicians, you tend, if you've got an audience, you'll perform. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> The performer thing didn't last long with me, though. It, that wasn't a favourite part of it for me. It was always being in a studio. Yeah, that's amazing how those roots are embedded so early in some people. And Graham Goble was very much like that, too, from Little Riverbank. Yeah, yeah. John, when did getting into bands start? Was that around the same time? Well, I played in a little band at school with my brother. We used to play a dance on Saturday nights. And then I met a kid on the train, you know, when I went to work when I left high school. And he was leaving his band and asked me if I wanted to join. So I joined that. And I only played in it for about two weeks. And in the second week, we were sharing the bill with the strangers. And after the gig, they asked me if I'd like to join the band. They must have been impressed. I don't know. Maybe desperate. I don't know. <laughs> Needed somebody <laughs> quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I joined up with them and I was with them for about six years. I mean, that was a tremendously successful period for you. I can remember going to see you guys at the old Brighton Town Hall. And once again, this biography that I made reference to before off air that we got from the internet, or I got from the internet, says that you're all driving very flash cars. And I Oh, yeah, that was a big thing there for, for a while. We weren't at all interested in cars until Terry Walker joined the group from <laughs> Perth. Yes. And he came over and he had a souped-up Falcon, Ford Falcon. So we thought, hmm, this looks pretty cool. So... He got us into cars. <laughs> well, that was tremendous that we all grow up expect, you know, don't go into the music business, you won't make any money at all. But you guys, you were very successful and there was a tremendous session period for the Strangers as well, wasn't there? Well, it was a fantastic period because it was the beginning of rock and roll. They'd been recording for a while before, obviously before we came along, but once the Go Show started, there was so much recording going on in Melbourne. People would come down from Sydney and record. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough to get in on, to learn about recording and arranging. And it was just a, a really interesting time. It must have been a fantastic period, I mean, because you were so involved. Is there any standout records that folks would know that you played on? I mean, because there would have been so much stuff that you did. Let me think. You did a lot of stuff for Johnny Young. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie Burns and Johnny well, Farnham. We're going to play the Ronnie Burns tracks, John. Virgin, which is a fantastic string arrangement in that. I mean, Johnny Young was great. He was working like a maniac. He gave us all a good chance to get in the studio. So you're successful in The Strangers, and then you, like everyone else, went out to England? Is that how it, it worked? Um, well, the next step? Well, we were playing at a hotel in the city and we opened for the Shadows. They asked me if I'd like to join the group. This was not long after I got married and we decided to go and give it a shot and go and live in England. Once I got to England and started working with the guys, then as a sideline, Bruce and I started to produce Olivia. So I spent most of my time at Abbey Road in England, which was another great experience for me. That's because Bruce was going out with Olivia at the time, is that right, John? So, I mean, that's how it started. When I first went to England, Hank was involved in doing a TV comedy show every week with, I can't remember if it was Lulu or Phila Black or something. Hank would be on every week, so Bruce and I, for a, a period of weeks, had nothing to do, so we went and did some tracks with Olivia until Hank was ready to start work. Didn't know Hank and that's was how it all started. When I first arrived in England, Olivia had just finished up doing a movie called Tomorrow, which hadn't sort of done anything, and so I think Festival had signed her and they wanted to get a recording, so we just happened to be there at that time. That means Olivia started recording in the UK and then she went on to US 
success. It didn't start. Yeah, when I started working with Bruce, with Olivia, we had a sort of reasonable size hit in England of If Not For You, the George Harrison song, and then a couple of other small ones, you know, like Banks of the Ohio, and then we did a couple of John Rostell songs, and they're the ones that took off in the States. The first one was Let Me Be There, Then If You Love Me, which is kind of let me be there again in a different key. (laughs) And then we sort of got a bit more adventurous and started to move more towards pop. And then poor old John died rather suddenly. Uh, John died not long after I arrived in England. He didn't live to see the success of those songs, which is... That's a shame. Yeah. Please, Mr. Please, he co-wrote with Bruce. That was a big hit in the States. John, can I just back up for a minute? I'm sorry if we get out of chronological sort of order, but uh, not to confuse you, but with no sort of cynicism or disrespect to the strangers, but to be to join the shadows which i'm sure would have been a major influence on you and certainly material for the strangers i mean that must have been an amazing thing for you to be asked to join a band that included probably like a hero or oh, someone def- from your peer Hank group was definitely a hero of mine you know when i was a kid it was a great thing for me and i loved the strangers to this day i'm still friends with them all yes and it was a difficult although there's no way i would not go you know <laughs> yeah, I yeah. To, obviously i had to do it exactly it was tough because we were very very close friends and also i was doing so much work in the studio at the time I mean it was going really well in Melbourne for me at that time yep. but it just seemed like I'd be foolish not to try this yep. you know? it was an obvious progression for you yeah. that would have happened in another way anyway wouldn't it obviously you know it's funny when you look back and you try and figure out how different things would have been if you hadn't have done yes. this at this particular point in time <laughs> yeah 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 John did we expect a strangers a reunion then <laughs> did you hear about it's a long way to the top the concert spectacular they did here in Oz is that the one Billy did that's right yeah, yeah. Yep. then there was a follow-up to TV series called Love is in the Air. Which we've been watching you on every week, and Pat as well. I haven't seen it yet. They, they said they'd send me a DVD of it. I mean, there's so much interest in American term, but this whole heritage market thing, which of course is happening in the US, and I guess this is our little, uh, the Australian mini version of the heritage market that's taking off here. Yeah. There's so much interest in nostalgia, I guess it's because all of us baby boomers are getting older. <laughs> speak, for you, speak for yourself. Yeah, speaking for myself, not for Nick. He's not yeah. an old bugger like I'm me. X, I think. <laughs> so, John, let's get on to Marvin Walsh and Farris. So at the time you were producing and with Olivia, was this the time that Marvin, Bruce and yourself formed Marvin Walsh and Farris? Yeah. The point of going over there was to form that group. And as I say, we couldn't work straight away, but as soon as we could, we all went down to Bruce's place in Portugal, which to me was, I mean, I couldn't believe my luck, you know. <laughs> so we went to Portugal to start writing. By the time I got there, they'd written most of the songs. I think I co-wrote maybe two of the first album. But we rehearsed in Portugal for a couple of weeks and then went back and recorded the first album at Abbey Road which was just a mind-boggling thrill for me exactly McCartney was always around there and Pink Floyd and it was just a fantastic time there and we did that first album and then we did one called Second Opinion that's right then in Quadraphonic Quadraphonic yeah apparently one of the first Quadraphonic albums did you notice in the studio they had to do I mean not being technical but was there a noticeable difference in the way you recorded that second album no no it was purely in the mixing we weren't there when they did the mixing of that it was like an experiment that they tried I think I don't think I've ever even heard it in quadraphonic wow. it, it's, it's a little hard to find a quadraphonic system <laughs> but after we did the second album and then things soured a little bit with Bruce and he sort of dropped out and Hank and I continued together we also recorded Shadows albums and every now and again we'd go out and work as the Shadows with Brian and they were always really fun fun things now is it true that Pat Carroll worked on some of your live dates playing keyboards I'm referring to my notes here. She certainly did, yeah. <laughs> So this predates Linda McCartney. <laughs> so you, I hope you don't get any flack for it, John. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no offence to Pat. I'm just, I'm just saying that you've always been uh, ahead of your game, John. <laughs> she had the task of trying to keep the ARP Odysseys in tune, which had just come out of oh, that Oh, yeah, time, exactly, yeah. Which was a bit of a nightmare and not fair to spring on anybody, you know, because you could only play two voices on each one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and women have such great organisational skills was that she would have been fantastic at that, I'm sure. Yeah, she was great, yeah. <laughs> was it a good creative time, being in Very, Marvin Wilson Farrell? It was a good creative time. I mean, in the studio in particular, unfortunately, when we worked live, we still had the shadows looming over us all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. The first gigs that they used to put us in were in the northern clubs, which were pretty tough places to work, you know. And you'd get about halfway through the act and somebody would yell out, hey, play Apache. Exactly. <laughs> and we could never beat that. We yeah. could never get around it, so we always ended up playing Apache and that would bring the house down and it was kind of it was a, we 
realised it was a losing battle. You yeah, know? it's very soul destroying, isn't it? I've been in that exact situation. I know what you mean. Yeah, I mean it's not like anyone's doing anything nasty or anything. It's just you're trying to do something different, and you just can't. Yeah, as a punter, you can understand that people want to hear the hits. Oh yeah, John, how come you guys called it Marvin Walsh and Farrah and not just a group name? Because if you've called it a group name, you might have been able to maybe disassociate well, yourself more. Mate. Well, we probably should have called ourselves the Shadows. I think that was pretty much decided before I came over, and I think a lot to do with the Crosby, Stills and Nash sort of thing that was going on at the time. That definitely, I think, was a mistake. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, musically, for me, I mean, Marvin Walsh and Farrow, the polar opposites to the Shadows, because the Shadows were basically instrumental pieces, and Marvin Walsh and Farrow sort of into the vocals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they wanted to do a harmony thing. The good news is that there's a compilation out on CD, and I think the Shadows fans, or maybe they were fans of Marvin Walsh and Farrow always, but I think there's more respect for Marvin Walsh and Farrow looking back, perhaps? I get that sense, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of emails about one of the Shadows albums that we did, too. So oh. yeah, they really like that. Rocking with Curly Leeds. Well, once again, referring to my notes, this guy has said that the BBC sessions also were hopefully going to be sort of released or issued by BBC or EMI in 2002. Is there any chance of that occurring, do you think? I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah, maybe wishful thinking again on this uh, guy's part. Well, if you get some royalties from the BBC, then you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've got an opinion from this guy on the website, and he gives you big rap jobs because he says you saved the shadows from extinction by enabling them to reinvent themselves. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's good, isn't he? He should become your publicist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When I read that piece, and I thought, there's got to be something there, though. I mean... No, I think it's... I right. thought, I mean, it's, the Shads yeah. are actually about to go out on tour again. I spoke to Brian the other day. I mean, they can sort of tour forever. That's what's good about England. The fans are loyal. Yeah. Marvin Welsh and Farris and the Shadows went into the background, and then you... What got you over to the United States, where you still are now? Well, I did over six years with the boys over in England, and then I think the last thing I did was Eurovision with the Shads. I'd done it, like, for three years. I did it with the living then I did it with Cliff and then I did it with the Shads and I just figured Olivia's career had so much potential in the States and I just thought it was time to move on. I still talk to the guys over there, we're still all friends. It was just the right thing to do. I don't think anything was going to change in England for me. Mm -hmm. Basically I wanted to be a writer and the only way I could do that was probably in America. I think you made the right call. So did you go first or did Olivia go first? Or? Olivia went about uh, a year before me and we did one album in England England while she was living in America and then I went over. And Pat didn't mind going to... No, not at no. all. Because my wife did. <laughs> <laughs> did she? Yeah. yeah, we lived in Hollywood though. Olivia, I mean she was a superstar, but you lucked out and Olivia lucked out there because the American market, except for the guy across the road here from Derek, very few Australians have reached that phenomenal level. Well, Australia's kind of the flavour of the month again at the moment. Again, yeah. It's like everything's Australian here, you know, with our movie stars and... Directors and... Yeah. 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 Amazing, really. There must be something. I think, and, and you would have spoken to this with your peers, with Billy Thorpe and people that we yeah. mentioned before. I'm sure that we, as you would have done growing up with The Strangers, that, you know, the live music situation in Australia was fantastic. And when this documentary we were talking about earlier, a Long Way to the Top, went to air, there was a nice sort of tribute from Brian Cadd. Brian was interviewed and said that Little River Band just cut its teeth and honed its craft by playing all of those pub gigs that we played in Australia, up and down the coast and everything. Yeah. And uh, there was so much work available here. And so it's been a fantastic training ground and proving ground. And I guess because, and you would have experienced this as much as myself, that growing up here and getting the influences of America and England on our charts and everything, we felt the underdogs and I think that there was a real desire to prove ourselves. I think a lot of stuff comes from hunger. Yeah, and it gives you a real resolve, doesn't it? It certainly does. And the way things are with downloading and all that now, Yes. and the way record sales are starting to slump, live music's probably going to be the only way to make a buck, you know, out of music. <laughs> well, let's hope so, John because we've got a thing called the pokies here. I don't know if you remember the pokies. Because yeah. <laughs> they weren't legal when you were here in the 60s. They are putting a large dent into the live scene here. A lot of, I know I've spoken to a lot of musicians who are complaining that the big hotels, especially the bringing in pokies. Pokies make a lot of money and bands charge a lot of money. Yeah, things are very different than they were in the 60s and 70s there. Yeah. Let's get on to Greece. Now, you wrote two songs for Greece. Yeah. You're the one that I want, and hopelessly they're devoted for you, which weren't in the original musical. So how did that come about, John? Well, Olivia was asked to do the movie, and they needed a ballad for her, and she said, 
well, how about letting John have a shot at it? It just worked out great for me. So I, I wrote that one and they liked that. And so then they said, well, would you like to have a shot at writing the closing? And it was just one of those freak things, you know. <laughs> it worked. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I remember watching Countdown here and it was number one week. I mean, I got sick of it. <laughs> it was number one week after week. And apparently it's one of the world's favourite karaoke songs. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those two songs have been very good to me. Yeah. <laughs> After that, I've got here, you've got John Farrah, solo LP for CBS Records, 1980. Yeah, strangely enough, in Amongst Greece and the Xanadu thing and the physical album, I managed to do a, an album of my own, which took me about a year. But it met with about the same enthusiasm that Martin Wilson Farrah did. <laughs> <laughs> So I decided that probably I'd better forget about that part of it. But I enjoyed doing it, and it still sounds okay, that album. I think you're suffering the Jimmy Webb syndrome. You have a lot of classic compositions, and then when you come to record your old album, you get ignored. And the album, I mean, Jimmy Webb's albums are great. Bit of a disappointment, or just sort of back to the drawing board? You know, in all honesty, you know, looking back on it, I think it was a very big disappointment to me, because I worked so hard on it, and I felt really strongly about the material. So I'd be lying if I didn't say I wasn't disappointed. Did they give it a big push? CBS? No, not really, no. no. And it was, um, my little dog was barking like an idiot out there. <laughs> That's all right. It's an Australian shepherd, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I went to New York and did like a, a presentation for all the staff there and I felt totally lost and realised that it wasn't my... I didn't have the confidence to walk into a room full of record company people and say, you know, here I am, <laughs> get a load of this. Yeah. You know, it didn't work for me, yeah. so it was kind of a lesson, I guess. And the, your true calling has always has been, in a production sense, you know, and I as a writer. So, yeah. 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 Well, it was interesting to go through the exercise, at least. But yeah. Any plans to do it again, Sean? No, not really, no. <laughs> What about, like, thinking back about Jimmy Webb again, your MacArthur Parks and Galvestones, he records them as well and puts them out on albums. Ever thought of that, or recording your own songs? And... I thought about that a couple of years ago, but I never went any further. I always got involved in something else. Yeah, and it's one thing to have the personal satisfaction, but then, as you said earlier, you've got to get the people that, as Joni Mitchell said, stoke the star-making machinery, I guess. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, to make it for yourself and have that satisfaction is one thing, but that's only part of the game, and it's nice to see a company oh, yeah. believe in it and get it out there as well, yeah. If you don't radiate that self-confidence and belief, you've got no chance, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Following on then, so the Heathcliff situation, which was a real surprise to me, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't know you had so much involvement with that. Oh, yeah, that was a fun project to do, yeah. mm -hmm. but it took quite a while because Tim was living in England and I was in Los Angeles. That's Tim Rice? Yeah. 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 So he would fax me lyrics and I'd you know, write to his lyrics, which I, I'd never written to lyrics before. So it was difficult, but once I got into it, it was, you know, a lot of fun. And Cliff, I mean, you couldn't have a nicer guy to work for than Cliff. Yes. Whose idea was it, John? Was it Cliff's? That was Cliff's, yeah. He's always been a like, in love man. with that story. I would think yeah. he always saw himself as Heathcliff. Unfortunately, it met with you know, a lot of bad critiques. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but musically, I was really happy with it. I have nothing to be ashamed of, I didn't think. Well, I think the next John Farrow musical show should be one what they're doing with the ABBA songs and the Queen songs. You have John Farrer music with all your songs. <laughs> Olivia suggested that to me. Yeah, you got enough hits there. Now, is there any truth to this situation of you perhaps doing Gidget, the musical? Yeah, we've actually done all the music. Wow, okay. And Francis Coppola did a, a sort of a, a scaled-down live show of it. He got me to find a performing arts school in Los Angeles where the kids could do it. He just yes. wanted to run it and see how it worked. Sort of like no budget at all. Did it at the Orange County performing arts school and just had the kids in the school sing all the songs and it was really fun right but since then has been involved in it he's doing a big movie called megalopolis yeah. so i haven't seen much of him lately i don't know what the plans are for the show he talked about possibly a movie or possibly a live show in london wow well, that would be great it would be nice mate yeah did he keep the original gidget theme <laughs> he took the original story and wrote his own screenplay on it we had the i think she might be still here there's some sort of surfing thing going on but the original gidget i've forgotten her name but the woman who it's based on i think she's about early 60s now and it was her father who wrote the book yeah i met her she came oh. to the show francis always felt it was a really good coming of age story i just hope that one day it'll happen you'll have to get sally field to play her mother now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
yeah, I'll be too old to do it soon. John, do you? How often do you get back to Australia? I get back about once a year. Right. Yeah. I was back earlier this year. Pat's coming out next week. So my brother's still there, and I end up sort of hanging out with my old buddies most of the time. Yeah. So you're obviously very much in touch with the place. So here we are, sort of talking to you as if perhaps you don't know what's going on, but you're probably very in touch with what's going on back here. Well, when I go out there, I sort of last time I went out, I had a great time. We all got together with guitars and sat around singing, and it really was fun, mate. Do you ever see yourself? Do you think, okay, when permanent retirement comes? Not that I should <laughs> predate you yet, but do you see yourself coming back or do you feel that you're comfortable now as a Californian? Well, it's the difficulty is both my kids are Americans. It'd be hard for us to leave them here. We always, in the back of our minds, felt that we'd come back and live in Australia. You know, maybe one day we will, but until our, our youngest boy, who's 15, mm -hmm. until he sort of becomes a man, I guess we'll be here. You know? Oh, well, I'm sorry to ask such a cliched question. I know that all expats get asked that and generally people will come up and say, well, it's a friendlier society and a, a healthier environment for our kids, but that's the usual answer, and I, I apologise if I was <laughs> Not at all. needling you for that kind of answer, but I'm sure that I've always felt very comfortable in California and in America as well, so I guess home is where the heart is, isn't it, really? Well, we always felt that if we came back, we might go and live on the Gold Coast or something like that. <laughs> I mean, Australia is so beautiful. There's so many places that we haven't really spent a lot of time, like up at the Queensland coast. Well, what's the island that Helen Reddy lives on? Norfolk. Yeah. Norfolk, Norfolk Island. Island. Yeah, I'm scared of all the poisonous things at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> John, the kids, any inclination to follow in their folks' footsteps? Oh, my oldest boy is 25, Sam, and he's in a group called Phantom Planet. And they're, they're, doing they're right. about to release their third album. Is Dad it. producing? Or? Oh, no, no. I actually stayed well away from it. Did he insist on it? <laughs> no, no. No, I didn't want to push him into music, but I did, I have to confess, I did keep buying him guitars when he was a little kid. Uh, yes, yeah. But the yeah, he's farm. a bass player now. The band's great. Their album comes out beginning of January, and the video was produced by Spike Jones. Oh, oh right, yeah. wow. I actually so, um, work in the same company as Spike Jones, funnily enough. You do? Oh, I used to, uh, Propaganda Films. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in Mansfield Avenue, Hollingwood. Yeah. <laughs> really? I'm pining now, John, sorry. <laughs> 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 no, I used to live over there in the mid-90s. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. I wish Sam all the best of success from us. Thanks, mate. Hopefully yeah. that will kick on. Uh, so, John, what are you up to at the moment? What are your plans next? I'm actually trying to write another musical at the moment. Oh, okay, and we're interrupting you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. What's this musical about? Can you say anything? Or? Not really. No. Moment, mate. Okay. I'm just trying to get some music and story ideas together. We're they just making sure you're keeping yourself busy. That's it. As long as you're oh. doing that, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I want to come back and start a band with you guys. Start, start a band with us or come and work at the station like us. <laughs> John, we'll do a... Uh, what do you call it? We'll do a Strangers Tribute Band. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They're very popular here. I, I just went out to see that Peter's doing this thing. I think he's probably still doing it. It was a couple of months ago. I went and they were doing that Beach Buddies thing. Oh, yeah, with Buddy England. Yeah. yeah, I went out to see that, and uh, they were great. You know, I took yeah. my son, who's 18, and has, of course, grown up with all that kind of music, listened to his dad's uh, 60s and 70s music, boring him. But they were great. I mean, you know, they really... And I don't know how well it's doing for them, but yeah. uh, it was great to see him back on stage and working again. Well, Pete is a perfectionist, you know. I'm sure he'll, he'll get it great, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, no, it was down to a T, you know. They did a really good job with it. Yeah. All right, well, look, John, we better let you go, but next time you're in town, we'll get you in the studio and we'll spin some Strangers tracks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. John Farrah from Los Angeles, California, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us. I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much, John. Regards to Pat. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, bye. John. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.